Hello everyone, and welcome to the Quorum Podcast. This is where academic medicine meets remote, austere, and resource-limited areas. Welcome back to the program. This is Averbo Kelly. This week, we are with Phil Clark. Phil is the back end of our Masters of Austere Critical Care. He's the one that's answering emails and passing them on to, to Dr. Troba. And I thought it would be a great time to have a wee bit of a chat and a cr- bit of a crack and talk to Phil. So, Phil, welcome to the program. Hello, and thank you. Pleased to be here. So, tell us a bit about yourself and what's keeping you busy. Um, yeah, it's a good question. So, uh, as well as the work I do with Corom, I, I have another another job as well. I work for a company that um, manufactures digital microscopes. And I'm a, a senior product manager for them, mostly on the software side. So that uh, that work keeps me reasonably busy. Um, I live in Austria um, for the last few years, although you may tell by the accent, not not Austrian. But uh, I have a young family here, so my my lad keeps me fairly busy as well. And especially with the the winter season coming up, he's he's mad for skiing, as many kids here are. Um, and so we're sort of getting ourselves sorted out for that. Um, I'd never never skied a day until about five years ago and uh, decided I'd, I'd better learn. But, um, yeah, that was a bit of a forlorn hope because I'm, I'm never keeping up with a 10-year-old uh, with a couple of years' experience under his belt. Um, other than that, yeah, just family life. We uh, live in the city of Graz, just on the outskirts. In the beginning of the summer, we got ourselves a dog, little puppy, and training training her has kept me pretty kept well kept all of us pretty busy cleaning up after has kept us busy as well but yeah that's that's largely life at the moment so how is your german um it's it's passable right um to be fair it 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 should be better and it's maybe a little embarrassing that it's it's not better than it is um i've i've had a very you know privileged uh work environment at Pressy Point and also at previous employers, <clears throat> they've always been in international companies um, where the the working language has been English. And so, while my German's you know, kind of good enough uh, in a social setting, in a in a bar, in a restaurant, in the in the supermarket to to give someone directions on the street, um, it's certainly not fluent enough in a in a business context, which is something I'm continually working on. Do you have the option to becoming a citizen if you pass the language test? Yeah, so that's that's uh, maybe, but do I want to is the question. So <laughs> um, I live in uh, living been living here for a while before. I mean, I, I'm an Australian, but I'm also a dual national. I have a have British citizenship as well. Uh, I lived in the UK for for 13 years or so, and. Um, became naturalized as UK citizen. So before Brexit, I was living here in Austria as, you know, uh, exercising my, my EU residency rights. So now I have a, uh, a special post Brexit visa, uh, article 50 visa, they call it, which, which allows me to stay here. Um, my wife is actually originally Ukrainian. Um, but she's taken out, um, Austrian citizenship as she's been here long enough now. So, um, yeah, effectively, if if we wanted to move to another EU country, then I would have the the spousal visa for an EU citizen. But the Austrians only let you have one citizenship, so uh, I would have to give up both my Australian and my British citizenship if I wish to take out the Austrian citizenship. So it's kind of uh, at the moment there's no need to do it uh, when when my wife is an EU citizen. That might change because here in Germany, they have allowed just recently dual citizenship. So perhaps in Austria, they'll, they'll follow suit. Yeah, I mean, may, maybe. Uh, I, I don't quite know how it's going to go. I guess my, my boy will have a decision to make in a few years' time. Um, he's here also on a British passport. He was born here in Austria, but because neither of his parents were Austrian at the time, he doesn't automatically qualify for Austrian citizenship. So, um, yeah, we, we got in British citizenship at the time, thinking that was the right thing to do. Um, and it's worked out okay. But I guess as he, yeah, when he gets to, yeah, gets older and gets of age, uh, he will have a choice to make whether, whether he wants to take out his Austrian citizenship, whether he can keep his British one, whether he, you know, wants to try for an Australian one. Uh, he's, he's got some options, but, uh, yeah, I'm not, I'm not sure whether, whether I need it or not yet, even if the, even if the rules change. 
So you're part of the college. You're part of the staff. How did that happen? How did you wake up one morning in Austria and suddenly just decide you're going to have a go at the college? Well, uh, the way it happened was, I guess I, yeah, my, my professional career has 90% been sat behind a computer doing one, one thing or another. And, um, I guess I came to a conclusion two or three years ago during COVID times, actually, that I really wished I had some more practical skills. Um, yeah, I, I can do, do pra- some practical things, right? I'm, yeah, I can do basic, whatever, automobile servicing. I, I worked on a farm to put myself through uh, university back in the day. So I'm, I'm not too bad with my hands, but I've never really had any kind of, you know, formal practical qualifications. Um, and the more I thought about it, I thought, well, actually, I'd, you know, I'd, I'd like to learn some, some medical skills. They seem like a, a good thing to have. And doing my online research, I, I found Curum and the... Uh, remote emergency medical technician course, which um, yeah, I had a, had a chat with uh, Tim Cranton, the, the course supervisor, and basically yeah, signed up. Again, this was during during COVID times, and I had no no previous medical experience at all, apart from you know basic basic first aid when I was a, a teenager back in Australia. I think as part of my part of my scouting work uh, back then, and um, yeah, I really enjoyed it. I, it was it was a challenge. Uh, I really really had a lot to learn, and to be fair, I, I probably should have uh, spent more time on the um, self directed online learning before the the practical week in Malta. Uh, I did enough, but I think more would have been would have been better. And then that practical week week in Malta was uh, was fantastic. I, I just loved it. Um, really really enjoyed the, the learning the skills, and and obviously was. Well, not obviously, but was fortunate enough to to uh, receive the award in the end. And so after after that, I thought, well, uh, yeah, I've I've enjoyed being a part of the college, and I like what the college does. Can I, um, yeah, can I offer something to them from my my professional skill set? And so I started having a chat with. Uh, well, originally it was with Tim Cranter, and then I started talking with John Clark, the the dean, and said, look, you know, um, some of the things I've done in my professional life has been around uh, what we call customer success. So um, it's not really customer support and it's not sales. It's, it's somewhere in between there to really make sure that, you know, when a customer buys your product, that they uh, are achieving their goals. So they don't buy the product because they want to buy your product. They buy your product because they want to do something. They want to achieve something, whether uh, whatever it is, um, they, they have a goal to reach. And so helping them to achieve that and ensuring they achieve that makes for happy customers. And so I sort of talked with John about how I could apply some of that knowledge um, on a student level. So, you know, people don't just sign up to whatever it is, the the REMT award, the bachelor award or the master's award, just because they they want to have a piece of paper in their pocket. They they have some kind of goal, whether it's personal or professional. Um Understanding that goal and then helping them to achieve that goal, uh, you know, makes for you know happier and and more fulfilled students, um, and yeah, you know, hopefully it's it's better for everyone, the student and and the college as well, and that's basically how it came about. So uh, yeah, John said let's let's try it and try things, and that was back I think in mm, February this year it was now, so it's been yeah ten eleven months or so ten months, um, and yeah, it's been. It's been great. So tell us, what do you do for the Masters of Osteocritical Care? Yeah, it started with the Masters. And to be honest, it's not not just the Masters now. We've expanded a little bit. But yeah, essentially, um, you know, my role there is around um, you know, answering student inquiries. I mean, there are other members of staff who have you know, specific roles uh, that answer specific inquiries. But in general, you know, coordinating those inquiries um, you know, answering student questions, trying to, to, to figure out, you know, uh, with Chuba and with uh, Esther, the, the, the program coordinator for the master's uh, program, you know, the best way for those students to move forward and to really, um, you know, complete the course in, in, in the best way possible. So um, one thing we, we did recently, I think sort of at the end of the summer, we set up a, uh, John and I set up a, 
um, a help, I guess, a professional help desk. So we, we're using a tool where um, all of the, the emails now come into a, a centralized inbox uh, from, from a number of the different college emails uh, that we have out there. And I, I coordinate those emails, assign them to the relevant people, including you, Everick, obviously, uh, but also you know, answer as many of those emails as I can myself uh, to provide the students with the information they really need. And the focus has been on the, on the master's program, you're right, and uh, I've actually had a number of, I guess, uh, what I call it, interviews or chats or whatever it is, video calls with, uh, with sort of eight or ten master's students just to introduce myself and to find out what's really driving them uh, in their studies. And the, yeah, as I said before, the goal here is to make sure that they're successful, but also to take that feedback um, and disseminate it uh, around the college to the, the relevant staff, whether it's, it's Chuba or John or yourself, uh, so that we can really, as a college, also improve our course offerings uh, and improve that student experience. I think it's made a profound difference, and I, I really appreciate that you've you've created that that well it, the system. It was there, but you've set it up, and, and now it's quite easy for us to manage uh, what inquiries come in from the different email addresses. And some will come to one address that uh, may be addressed to you, but now you got to send it off to someone else, and it's uh, definitely reduced our, our workload profoundly. So fair play to you. Thanks. Thanks, Eric. I think we're getting there, right? I, you know, it's one of those, I think, you know, there's a, there's a name for it. I can't think of what it is, but it's kind of the eighty the eighty twenty rule, right? I think we're we're maybe eighty percent there, and there's probably still another twenty percent improvement we could really, really uh, add twenty uh, percent value we could add. Um, but that takes much longer than that first eighty percent getting things up and running. So uh, I think over time, over the next six six nine months, um, yeah, we can even improve the process further. I found with the different universities that I've graduated from that getting a, an answer back it takes a fortnight at least. And I'm glad that we're doing a bit better than that, I think, that uh, getting getting access to these emails and, and sorting out who answers them and then hopefully getting an answer back before a whole fortnight goes by. Yeah, I mean, we're, we're working on turnaround times. You know, everybody's, uh, you know, all the faculty are, are busy. Uh, we all, you know, seem to wear multiple hats doing different things. Um, but yeah, we, we do try and get back to students as, as quickly as we possible as possible. The you know, the target would be would be forty eight hours. Sometimes it takes a little bit longer than that. And this last you know ten days or so, I've uh, you know been a little bit under the weather myself, and so I'm a little bit behind in answering some of those emails as well. It, it happens. But the great thing is when there's a team of people that have access to those that you know, that that unified inbox, uh, you know, we can all work together and, and pick up those emails from each other and um, you know, hopefully ensure that those turnaround times stay stay pretty quick. So what improvements would you like to see on the the back end, the the, the parts that the students don't get to see? And how how would you make uh, make the college a better place if you had the uh, ear of the dean? Well, we, we've made some really good strides recently. I think um, the way in which we now uh, disseminate our information, so... You know, the website was recently updated, uh, which I think has made things a lot a lot clearer. I think, the, you know, the way that students can find information, I still think there's more we could do there. So, um, you know, one thing that's been on my plate for a little while, which, which I really need to move forward is a, I guess we call it a frequently asked questions, but some kind of database uh, of answers that we could publish there on the website. So, um, you know, when the student, instead of having to, to ask all the time and wait for a response, they can, they can help themselves uh, by looking into this kind of database of, of you know, frequently asked questions or knowledge. Um, and even if they haven't looked there, then when they do respond to us, we can quickly point them in the right direction and um, you know, kindly say, you know, here's, here's your answer plus, plus some more information. So I just think, um, yeah, they're not, I don't want to, they're not, they're not canned responses, but some kind of uh, yeah database uh, of knowledge that the students can help themselves a little bit more. I think this would be this would be excellent. Um, I really like uh, a lot of the stuff that seems to be be happening um, 
you know, in the last few months. So I, I've also signed up as a student to the the, the Bachelor of Science uh, course, and um, as a first year student there, um, you know, Tim Cranton at the beginning of October uh, kind of had an onboarding meeting for all new students, which I thought was was absolutely fantastic. Um, and I think with the the way that that course is now also being uh, the, the information that's being made available online, um, the way the, the it, it's being you know, distributed to students. Um, again, I think it's it's made big strides this, uh, in in the last semester. Uh, I think there's probably probably even further we can we can go. So it's I guess what I'm saying mostly is around you know communication, better ways of communicating. Um, you know, I'm not having a medical background. I really can't comment on the the course curriculum or the or the content or whether we should be offering more courses or, or less courses. Um, but yeah, just keeping those, those lines of communication open and, um, allow, yeah, providing students with maybe even more information than they need rather than, than less. I think this would be, uh, this is a, yeah, a goal to, to strive towards. We have found that the, a lot of the questions repeat themselves. So having a, a set answer for some of the common questions would be, uh, profoundly beneficial. Yeah, again, I, I don't, you know, I don't think we we need to have you know, canned responses that we just shoot out like a uh, like a like an AI or like a like a robot. Um, but yeah, using using this those um, you know those answers as kind of the base. I think a lot of the stuff I see coming in now uh, to the shared inbox are very very similar questions, but uh, they often have a a unique twist to it as well. So someone will will say, you know, yeah, this is who I am and this is what I'm interested in doing. How do I get from A to B? Um, and maybe because of their personal circumstance, getting from A to B is a little bit different to someone else getting from A to B. So it's not just a matter of cutting and pasting the response. It does still need to be personalized. But at least with that uh, you know, initial database of knowledge, we've got a point to work from, um, you know, which, which saves time uh, and gets a response out to the student quicker. One of the benefits of having a nonprofit is the individualized responses we can do. I, and I was, it was paramount when I set up the college that we were going to be a student focused institution and be able to give like, like you say, can, can answers are, are, well, it's, it's needed at times, but I like the fact that even now that we have well over a hundred students enrolled, that we are able to address each and every question coming in individually and and look at them even though it's the same bloody question that we've seen so many times over the last 10 years but you're right it's nuanced isn't it like they're coming at it Absolutely. like uh yes I, I i need to extend and here's why and here's an here's a way that i'm gonna move forward with it and i like the fact that you and everyone else in the, in the office has has picked up with that passion with that uh need to answer the questions individually and it's it's not that original concept that i had the original drive to have uh just to be there for the students has uh, has kept going and and i i'm not sure how that's happened but i i see that in all levels of the college and you are now picking up that torch and running yeah absolutely i mean as you said everyone is is uh a, yeah a unique case right um you know, what i've i've found just to use an example you know sometimes people need a little bit more time to finish a module or finish their course or you know maybe they even need to defer um and you know it, the reasons that people have uh are, are so diverse and i think sometimes they're things you wouldn't mm, so often find in other educational institutes because of the nature of what corom is so you know there's people that are you know um I've, I've got to deploy right with my unit and i won't have time to study for the next three months six months whatever can i can i defer or i've got um you know my my roster for the next three or four weeks is you know completely hectic uh I, i'm working you know whatever uh almost seven seven days a week i just don't have time to, to finish the the essay i need for this module um yeah, you know, I, I guess in in other other colleges, you know, people have those unique um, uh, reasons as well. 
um, but they're just different, unique reasons. And so I think um, being able to provide that personal touch because of the, the you know, so it's, it's not my background, but so many of the people of the, you know, the, the staff of the college, yourself, John, the, the course lecturers, come from a very similar background. Um, uh, they can be very empathetic uh, with the students and very understanding about the reasons why they, they need to, you know, maybe a little bit more time or they need a little bit more assistance. Um, and I just I really appreciate that student-focused uh, approach. Yeah, I think uh, in many businesses, it's a, it's somehow it's a goal that that you that the businesses want to obtain, but at the same time, a business can be very uh, and you know in in the the society we live in uh, maybe needs to be very profit driven, um, and if their business can understand that actually, um, you know, being customer or client uh, led leads to, you know, a, you know more profit, then that's fantastic. But working for a non profit really being able to like Coron, really being able to focus on being um so student centric um you know it's 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 really refreshing and i think that's part of the college's yeah, unique uh success formula one of the many advantages that the college has is our student body is generally older so they they kind of have sorted themselves out in some way or fashion and they know who they are they know what they want to do and they're just pushing and they're passionate for it. Whereas a normal paramedic, I don't want to say normal, sorry, a, a another paramedic option would be for a bachelor's degree paramedic to get a 17-year-old, 18-year-old, uh, like 250 of them coming in every every September. And now the the mentors, the, the, the faculty have to deal with 18-year-old problems at times 250 as we're trying to also teach them the same things we're teaching uh, here at the college and our medium age is, is what uh, 32, 34. So it's, it's really enjoyable to deal with this. And so you're keep talking about student focus and, 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 and it's precisely what we're on about. And it's, it's part of that is the fact that we have to cater to a different type of student. Yeah. I mean, that, that's true. Um, you know, when I did that, uh, you know, REMT course, um, God, it was a year ago now, time flies. You know, the, 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 the people that I met during the, the practical week, you know, there's a guy you know, who worked for the UN, a guy who worked for the World Health Organization, uh, you know, another guy who's, um, you know, working uh, as a, you know, mountain rescue and, and avalanche guy. But, you know, these were all, I mean, I think I was, you know, clearly that I was definitely the oldest person there and, and the one with the least amount of medical background. But there was also a, you know, a young guy, I think he was, must've been 18 or 19 a, fr from Malta, um, who was probably the most keen and the most driven out of all of us on that course. He really, you know, put everything into it and had a ton of energy. Um, so I think, you know, having, the mix of, of young guys that, um, you know, people, young people that, that are, you know, absolutely motivated and full of energy uh, is, is great because it can keep some of the older guys like me, uh, you know, tracking along and, and also that motivation rubs off a little bit. Um, but you're absolutely right with, with the older students. Um, yeah. They perhaps uh, know a little bit more about where they want to be in life and, and where they want to, get to and what their motivations are um and yeah that leads to i think um what's the word i'm looking for you know if you have a, a, a say a 17 or 18 year old who's come straight out of whatever high school or, or maybe a year or two of college you know that they're, they're still figuring out how to manage life how to manage responsibilities how to manage uh competing um you know priorities i guess um whereas i think when you're a little bit older maybe work for a few years maybe you've uh yeah you've obviously had to deal with different interpersonal relationships and just having that experience also helps you to i think study uh more effectively so managing your time okay you know i need to put this time aside to study um and you know i need to prioritize that into my daily routine i think this is a this is a big benefit as well I found that in my own 
experience in academia, starting in the in the mid to late eighties. I was rubbish. I was failing everything. I just didn't didn't quite understand what I wanted. And then the uh, the army was my undergraduate training, and it and it when I got out after after being an SF, the it was so much easier to get into academia living that uh, I maybe we should start a, a basic training here in college and uh, get people. <laughs> into that same mind frame that I had, but I was an awful Egypt when I was in my late 18s and, and 18, 19 and, and, and early twenties. And there's no way I could have done a, a degree. And I was what, 32, 33 when I started grad school and bloody hell, I'm, I'm pushing 60 and I'm still doing a PhD. So the, the age does, does make a difference. Lifelong learning, Everett, that's what it is. But uh, yeah, I mean, I was, I was similar when I did my, my first undergraduate degree in Australia there as a, you know, what, 18, 19, 20 year old. But my first year uh, of my bachelor's degree, I got some pretty decent marks. But by my third year, I was, I was lucky to pass. And that really came down to, I think, putting no more effort in first year to third year. But the work obviously got a whole lot harder. Um, and I just, yeah, I was more focused on yeah, doing the things that a, a, a young man likes to do and, and in, enjoying um, life. Uh, sort of, I don't know, 10, 13 years later, um, I did do an, an online uh, remote or remote uh, master's degree when I was in the UK. And I actually found the whole process much more satisfactory. I think it was around, even though I had to fit that around work, I had to fit that around my personal life. Um, it was just so much more easier uh, so, so much easier to manage that uh, with a few years' experience, right? When you, uh, you know, when you're working, um, you, you know, in your work life, you have certain deliverables. You have to do certain things, uh, and you know, if you don't do it, then it's it's kind of your your job's on the line, right? There's no one, there's no one sitting saying, "Oh, well, yeah, too bad. You can you can come back next semester and you can do that course again." Um, that's not the way it works when you're working professionally, you really have to manage your time. Um, and if you can then apply that um, to, to study um, as a, you know, maybe someone a little bit older, uh, I think this uh, really puts you in, in good stead. Yeah. So having both of us say that, I do want to give accolades to the yokes out there who are 17, 18 years of age, know precisely who they are and what they want to do. And they hit the ground running and are doing far better than I ever did. Uh, so it is possible for the young ones to to be motivated, and and we we do get them coming through from time to time, uh, but it, you know by far most people would definitely be better off doing our programs with uh, a, a a bit of kilometers under the belt. Yeah, like I said, that the young guy from Malta that was on my REMT course was the most motivated out of all of us, right? And uh, you know, I just I have to admire that. He just was single-minded, really needed, wanted to get it done. I think he had to commute from the other side of the island where the rest of us that were there for the week were all staying you know, really close to the classroom. I think he had something like a – he didn't have his own car and he's on public transport. It was like an hour and a half commute each way. Uh, and yet he was always the first one there in the morning. Um, so, yeah, absolutely. If 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 the, you know what you want and, you, and you, you know motivated enough to go out there and get it as a – yeah, uh, as a young young person, uh, then yeah, fair fair play to you, right? Uh, absolutely, Phil. I I noticed that you work in microscopy, digital microscopy, and AI. And as an avid fan of microscopy in austere environments, now I know you're on about all these like really high end stuff being at pathology labs, but uh, microscopy is microscopy anywhere, but. I'm I'm curious. I mean, is there things coming down the pipeline where those of us who are passionate about looking down the microscope is gone? Like, are, are we looking at AI that's going to be able to diagnose malaria way better than any of us? Yeah, probably. But so, uh, yeah, as as you alluded to, my my kind of my, my other job uh, working for for a company, Pressy Point, who manufactures. Uh, you know, very high-end digital microscopes and, and scanners. Um, I've also worked very much in the field of um, 
AI, but but not AI in the sense of these large language models like ChatGPT, uh, but more about image image analysis. Um, and for sure, um, models can be built to analyze images uh, and do a um, objectively better job than a human looking at that image. Just because the AI can or the model can pick up so much more information than than the human eye can. But having said that, they're not. Uh, they're all those models are also not you know foolproof. And so I think the the best way forward using maybe your malaria example is. You know, you you may have uh, a whole lot of you know slide samples, uh, you know, with with uh, or you know, blood samples that you run through your uh, malaria model, and the model can analyze a lot more of those samples in a much shorter time period than uh, the human a human could. But what you really want out of that model is probably a you know yes or no, or a positive or negative. So yes, this sample, the model thinks um, is you know, positive for malaria. This one is negative. And then the next step is that the human goes and looks at those uh, positive samples and confirms that that is, that is the case. Um, if you want to bring it back to um, something like, uh, let's say we're, we're looking at, at, at cancer. And so you want the AI to kind of direct the pathologist to a specific area uh, of the tissue sample and say, hey, we think here is is carcinoma. And then the pathologist goes and looks at that specific area. So instead of the pathologist spending a couple of minutes looking around the whole, uh, the whole image or the whole slide, uh, they can be very much directed to a specific area by the, by the model. So I think, um, it's it's both. It's the human and the and the machine working together, rather than the machine just completely taking over because they're just not a hundred percent foolproof, right? The the model um, is never going to be a hundred percent correct, and I think you're always going to need the human in in the loop. But in terms of the remote stuff, um, yeah, there's some some really interesting things happening. Um, you know, we are. Uh, that the company I work for, Pressy Point, we uh, recently sold uh, some of our devices, which are going to be installed in hospitals in uh, in an African country. I can't go into too much detail due to you know the, the client confidentiality, but these uh, these uh, microscopes will be installed in in uh, hos- in hospitals in Africa one particular country where they, they just don't have pathologists or very many pathologists. Then we have one of our software solutions allows the image on the microscope to be streamed uh, live over the internet. And essentially pathologists back in Germany will be used to uh, analyze those images that are coming uh, from from Africa. So it's, it's a process called a frozen section. So essentially... Um, you know, a surgeon is maybe removing you know cancerous tissue and then around the edges they they take take a little bit more tissue um, they you know uh, have to prepare that put it under the microscope uh, and then the pathologist has a look at it and says yep uh, you know you've 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 got rid of all the all the cancer here you can uh, sew the patient up or maybe you need to take a little bit more and so when you don't have a pathologist on site right next to the surgery room um, that's quite a challenge to do but when you can stream that image, across thousands of kilometers uh, or to wherever the path- it might just be across the city but in this case thousands of kilometers to where the pathologist is available um, you know it really has the opportunity to um, you know enhance healthcare care um, in those locations where where the staff just can't be or the infrastructure just just isn't at this point well telemedicine is is huge isn't it it's, it's all about telemedicine absolutely and I think the next thing there is 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 when we start integrating the models into that, uh, you know, the the AI models or the machine learning models into that uh, into that process as well. I would like to see a smartphone based AI model with a microscope viewer that we plug in that's no bigger than a coffee cup, and I mean, and we're 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 there, aren't we? We're just there's no money for those of us. Who are out out in, in in austere environments or third world comp- countries to to get these these views? But um, that's I mean I would love to see, and I think it's, it is definitely coming. 
to to where AI will do better than than those of us who are, are trained to to see malaria under microscope. Yeah, there's, um, I know of a uh, you know again I'm not going to promote one particular company, but I know of a company uh, out of Portugal that have built a small and portable um, blood analysis device that uses uh, you know, AI models to to analyze blood. So it's not you know, I think their their first one was being able to to blood type. So the idea was uh, with just a small you know pinprick sample of blood, they could immediately um, you know get the blood type using this small device, which kind of takes out of the the picture the whole I guess the manual process of of needing to find someone's blood type in a in a remote or in, austere environment. Um, but then on top of that, they've started adding other algorithms to detect you know different things uh i'm not sure I, to be honest I'm not sure if malaria is one of them uh but essentially it just needs a few mil of blood into this portable device um the ai model does its stuff uh, and you get a, an answer back fast enough now in a in a remote and austere environment that might be all you need in the first instance you know if you were in the you know the the well funded city hospital then perhaps you'd you'd want to have something uh yeah, you know, something a little bit more, a few more, you know, with, with a human in the loop. But again, in that remote environment, uh, that's that's probably you know e- enough to to get you um, to at least understand what the, what you need to do with that patient. Uh, and I, I know this device is is pretty small and portable. Uh, I think it's only a prototype at the moment. But I see things like that, um, or as you as you mentioned, the kind of smartphone based uh, microscope. I think the challenges there are going to be around. Uh, image quality, uh, although yeah, as we know, smartphone cameras are getting better and better all the time. Um, and so, once you're able to, you know, take a you know an image of high enough quality that when you zoom in, you can really see uh, what needs to be seen. Then, yeah, absolutely, I think that's that's a fantastic way forward. That's the hope, anyway. Phil Clark, my final question for you is this: What advice do you have for the new medic, the new nurse, the new doc? who is just starting their career in austere medicine. Check out CoROM, obviously. Um, yeah, there's some, some great courses there. Um, yeah, if you're not, I say, if you're not sure uh, what, what direction you want to go or, or whether you want to actually sign up for, let's say, a full, uh, you know, full undergraduate course, then really have a look at that uh, REMT course, Remote uh emergency medical technician course it, it, it's also a module for the for the bsc so if you you can do it as a standalone but if you do it you get a taste for the college uh for the teaching methods for the the con the, the content that remt is also a uh yeah one of the the first year modules for the bsc so you'd automatically get credit for that so yeah absolutely i mean have a look at coram's offering but then i'd also say you know go out there and, and it's something that i i yeah, you know, I don't think my career is going to end up being a, a full-time professional uh, medic, but um, is go out there and get some experience as well, wherever that is and however that is. Uh, I think there's no no substitute for um, you know hands-on experience, whether that's whatever um, you know an expedition leader somewhere or you know, being part of an expedition uh, through some you know mountainous terrain. Maybe it's uh, yeah working with your local uh, dive group as a, as a medic for dives or whatever the case is. Um, yeah. Just going out and getting some hands-on experience, I think is probably the, the number one thing you can do to, to both improve your knowledge and your skills, but also to understand more about yourself and maybe where you want your career to go. Good advice. Phil, thanks for being a guest on our podcast. And I look forward to seeing you continue to excel within the college staff. Thanks, Avrik. It's been been a pleasure. Um, yeah, thanks very much. This has been a presentation from the College of Remote and Offshore Medicine. If you would like to earn CTD credits for this podcast, you can join the Council of Members. Being a member of the college gives you free CTD credit, free access for our virtual field guide, and discounts on our e-learning courses. You can join the team on our college website at Quorum dot edu dot mt